following is an exclusive presentation of the Yes Network. John Sterling is the voice of baseball in New York. When you listen to John, you are visualizing the game as he's speaking. He is passionate about the game and the Yankees. Please welcome the one, the only, John Sterling. This is Center Stage with Michael Kay. Here's your host, Michael Kay. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to Center Stage. Today's guest is a New York City native from upstate New York and eventually became the play-by-play -play announcer for the New York Islanders. He later moved south to call games for the Atlanta Braves and the Hawks, but returned to New York to call over 4,500 straight Yankee games on the radio. Known for his unique and distinctive delivery, please welcome the one, the only, John Sterling. What's up? <laughs> John and I have not spoken since we worked together 16 years ago. It's amazing. So it's the first time we've seen each other. Uh, John, uh, 4,500 consecutive Yankee games going back to the, the late 80s when you first got the job. Does that mean something to you, the consecutive game streak? No. Really? I mean, <laughs> I mean I'm very happy, you know, that I've had this unusual health. You right. know, and, and my dad used to knock on wood all the time. But actually, this all began in 1981. And I did a Hawks game. Uh, the first game I did, I uh, have not missed a game in 37 seasons. And uh, there were five years in Atlanta where I was doing the Hawks and Braves, and I was doing, you know, like 220 games a year. I find it amazing, but um, I don't think about it. I don't think, oh boy, I'm adding another one. You know? All right. Did you ever almost miss one? No. I remember June of 2016, you were, you were willing to miss one for yes. your daughter's graduation, yeah. right? How'd it work out that you didn't have to miss one? Either the Yankees didn't, oh, the Yankees didn't play. Okay. When the, the trips graduate, um, if it's a conflict with the game, I will miss the game. But it's, it won't, it isn't that I'll think, oh my, I've missed a game, you know. It's... But it, it is a source of pride, I mean, because well, yeah, baseball's that's... a grind. I mean, the Boy. travel, 162 games, very few days off. For somebody to do every single game and you do every inning of the play-by-play, -play, right? That's that's not easy. Yeah, and uh, you know my voices remain true. You know, after all these years, the toughest part on the job by far is uh, the Yankees don't get getaway day games because they're the Yankees, and the home team hopes for a bigger crowd and they want the TV games at night where there's a bigger audience. We never get getaway day games. So the toughest part of the job is getting there at four in the morning. Right. And I don't fall asleep right away. I stay up for an hour, hour and a half, whatever town I get to, whatever hotel I'm in. And so, you know, you're going to bed at five or six. What an unusual, like your nightclub comics in the 40s. Right. Or so, you know, so. Now, you spent almost a decade in Atlanta before you got the, the Yankee job. How did the Yankee job come about? Did you audition for it? Did you, did you apply for it? How did it come about? Just one of the lucky things that happened in our nutty business. I got a phone call in September of 88 from a fellow that you know, Steve Malsberg at, at WABC. And he said, would you like to do the Yankees? And I said, well, I don't want to give up the Hawks. <laughs> Wasn't right. that funny? Well, and, you uh, loved your time in Atlanta. Oh, I loved it. Oh, I had a, a great life in Atlanta. Anyway, um, here is such a big job, the Yankee job. Mm -hmm. And I got it without an audition. Um, he told me they have a new general manager, and he doesn't like the broadcast team and their history at the end of the year. And I said, well, does he know who I am? And he said, he knows all about you. He listens to you all the time. He was a sports fan. His name was Fred Winehouse. And in the 70s, when I had the MCA talk show on the Nets and Islanders and all that, he listened. Then I go to Atlanta. Well, the Hawks and Braves are on TBS, coming into his Manhattan apartment. 
And I didn't have an agent. So I called um, a buddy of mine who worked with me on the air with the Nets, Mike D. Tommaso, who's a lawyer. And I said, would you call this guy? And he called him and he made a deal. I never auditioned for the Yankees. Is that amazing? It is pretty amazing. What a nutty business. And that you didn't apply for it. I didn't apply for it and I didn't audition. Now, and I got it right away. There was a gentleman by the name of George Steinbrenner who owned the team then. Right. Uh, had you ever met him before? And if you hadn't, when you did meet him, what was your first impression? No, I had met him many times. Um, Gabe Paul took a liking to me. And Former Tal GM. Smith. Right. And they introduced me and said, well, we really want you to meet. You know all that stuff. And uh, so I'm in an elevator in uh, Fort Lauderdale in the hotel we're in. And I get in the elevator and George is on the elevator. <laughs> we ride down together and he said to me, I always wanted you to be the Yankee announcer. <laughs> now George talks. And I said, well, thank you. You know, blah, blah, blah. So Now... Your first four seasons with the Yankees were losing seasons, so you probably thought, I left a great life in Atlanta, this team's not winning. Well, well my, my first year was the worst year. You know, I've, I've, I'm so lucky, I've had, every year is a good year, every day is a good day for me. But in 89, my sister took ill. And uh, I've never gotten over it, you know, it's cancer. Died in a couple of months, and um, that was a very tough year, 89. Now, from what I remember, John, you endeared yourself to, to George Steinbrenner about a comment you made during the broadcast. The team was playing poorly, and you said, you know, don't blame the GM and the owner, right? Yeah, it was a couple of years later. George and whoever the, the GM was, they had, you know, <laughs> the GM du jour. Right. You know. <laughs> uh, they're getting killed in the newspapers. <laughs> And the, the team was very bad, 89, 90, 91, terrible teams. And um, I said on, it was a Sunday, and I went on my soapbox, my high horse, as one of those people would say in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, uh, what are you blaming George Steinbrenner and, let's say, Bob Quinn was the GM. I think it was Pete Peterson. Peterson. Right, yeah. Pete Peterson. And I said... Now, blame the players. They're the, they're the ones who are making out. They're the ones who can't get anyone out. So two nights later, we're in Milwaukee, and there's a rain delay. And uh, so I'm walking, walking around uh, this maze of booths in this old stadium, and George is sitting in one of the booths. And he stopped me. And uh, think of how good this made me feel. And he said to me, I just want you to know, you'll always be the Yankee announcer. And if they, <laughs> if they try to hire anyone, I'll veto it. <laughs> so I, I figured... <laughs> so I figured that he had heard, you know, what I said that day. You right. know, and, it, and he liked it. Now, obviously, one of the things that people love about the way you do the game is the home run calls, the embellished home run calls. Where did that first come about? Well, when I was doing the Nets, um, I, uh, Bernard King was the star. Mm -hmm. And I would say, uh, the, and the players called him B.B., you know, after the guitarist B.B. King. And, you know, he would hit a great shot or great drive, and I'd say, uh, Bernard Sky, B.B. King. And uh, then in Atlanta, um, Dominique was the star of the Hawks, and uh, I would say, you know, he hit a great shot, and I'd say, Dominique is magnifique, and, or Dominique is terrifique, and um, those kind of things caught on. Um, with the Yankees, I guess one day, Bernie Williams hit one, and I said, burn, baby, burn, and that was the beginning of it. Now, what's your favorite one, and did any oh, player boy. ever object to it? No player has ever objected it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Nick Swisher hit a home run, and I'd say he's... <laughs> By the way, I don't take them seriously. They're all so dumb, you know. It's just, <laughs> they're just... You know, I'm not discovering a cure for cancer. I mean, it's just a play on words. But anyway, I called him old jolly old St. Nick. <laughs> and he didn't like it. He said, Nick... Makes me sound like a, a, a fat old man. <laughs> so um, I changed it to he's Swisherlicious, and he loved that. Yeah, so. I think he used to call himself that. Yeah, yeah. All right, so where did this all begin? We're going to take a trip to Manhattan's Upper East Side when we get back with John Sterling right here on Center Street. 
swung on, there it goes. Deep right field, it is high, it is far, it is gone in the second deck. It's a grand slam. Oh, he is positively swishalicious. Welcome back to Center Stage, everybody. We're talking with John Sterling, the Emmy Award-winning sports announcer. Now, John, you're you're a native of Manhattan. Right. So tell me what little John Sterling was like. When I was a little boy, I don't know the reason, I fell in love with sports and music. And I've had those two as companions for all my life. And um, I'm very lucky. I think I'm very lucky to be a sports fan. You always have something going on. Nowadays, mm -hmm. they all overlap. So when I was a little boy, I knew I was going to be on the air when I was really young. That's what you wanted to do or yeah. you just knew it? No, I, I knew it. It was inside of me. I really believe that. Did you always have this voice even as a little kid? Yeah, as a little boy, I really... <laughs> I didn't understand. I'd be at cocktail parties serving drinks or whatever as a little boy. As a little kid? As a little drink? kid. Really? You know, I'd run around and at such an... The adults would say to me, when are you going to grow up to your voice? So right. I had a deep voice when I was a little boy. Right. And... Um, that's not why I wanted to be on the air. I didn't know that was a good thing. Right, you know, right. Just happened. Now, did your parents nurture this? Or did they say, yeah, you can do this? I don't, I think they were worried about other things I did, like uh, failing in school. So I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think anyone encouraged me. I, I've, I've been, you know, they call people self-starters. Mm -hmm. I'm a self-starter. You know, I know what I want and I go after it. So do you, of course, mm -hmm. you know. Now, interest in sports, though. Where did that come about? Was that just natural? Did you play? Uh, I, I can't explain it. The radio was on. I was in a car, a little boy sitting in the middle in the front seat, and the 46 World Series was on. Oh, my God. I fell in love with it. And from that, and then I was a Yankee fan, and they had this unprecedented amount of success. Now, you, um, you played high school baseball, football, and basketball at McBurney High, right. which was a college prep school on the Upper West Side, run by the YMCA. You played, later played some college basketball at Moravian College as a guard. I did. So you were pretty good. Good enough. Oh, you know. Favorite teams going Good up. enough to be a slow white guard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what were your favorite teams growing up? Was it the Yankees? Oh, no, the, yes. Oh, I was, I was a Yankee fan, and I, I love the Knicks and the Rangers and... Uh, uh, and the Giants, just, uh, they weren't there in proliferation like they are now. Mm -hmm. So when I would go to a game, boy, I would, I would think that was the greatest thing in the world. Now, throughout all your broadcasts all these years, you have a lot of references to Broadway musicals. When did that love come about? Um, one day, you know, I have a good story for you. You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> They're lucky. It was a Saturday afternoon, and my mother and sister were begging me to go to this Broadway show. And I'm gonna stay home and watch a ball game. The show was Kiss Me Kate. And I have to use a naughty word, which I guess you can bleep out. Sure, it's okay. cable though. Okay. That's right, it's cable. <laughs> Cole Porter's greatest work was Kiss Me Kate. Every single song, just magic. But anyway, in the show, you know, they all sing another, open another show. And then the, um, the female star came out, a gal named Patricia Morrison, and she was having fights with the male star, who was Alfred Drake. And she came on stage and said to him, you bastard. Well, I thought that was the greatest. I mean, I, I'm seven years old. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And from that time, I was hooked. I went to Fordham, and I loved Fordham. And I always think to myself, gee, it would be nice, you know, it would have been nice to try a big college like North Carolina. Well, you tried every college. I tried three You went three to of Moravian, them. you went to Boston University, then you, Columbia School of General Studies. Were you just trying them all out, or you just weren't good? Well, um, <laughs> all my friends were in Boston. A okay. bunch of them were at Harvard. And I transferred to BU from Moravian. I, I got in before they even saw my marks. And then uh, my mom passed away, and so I, I went back home, and I went into Columbia, but to general studies, as you say. Right. But it, that worked out, too, because the general studies, yeah, I'm looking in the pamphlet one day to register, and they had a class given at NBC, given by the WNBC program director. I had to get in that class. Right. 
And I told the registrar that, and he said, well, it's really for people who are going in the business. I said, well, I'm going in the business. So he had me read a, a pamphlet on, on a, a building program, really dry reading. Right. And I read it, and he said, well, you know, you have a pretty good voice. I'll, I'll put you in the program. Now, don't think this is bragging. It's not. This is what I do for a living. This is what's inside of me. It's intrinsic. I, I could have done this when I was 12 or 14. You know, people laugh at me, oh yeah, sure, you're gonna be on the air, sure. Um, in this class, you know, I was Michael Jordan. I mean, I, <laughs> at, at the end of the class, um, this guy, his name was Steve White, the program director. Oh, it was given at WNBC. It was given in these old studios. Oh, I'm, I loved it. It was a one, one night a week, two and a half hour class. And I never had such happiness, <laughs> you know, and something I did, I, right. was, I was doing this in my mind from the time I was 10 years old, imitating every disc jockey I ever heard, and all their acts and all their sounds, and uh, he gave me an A+. Plus. <laughs> was that the first one you had? <laughs> <laughs> the very first. <laughs> and he said, you're good enough to go out. Well, how do you go out? Well, you make up a tape. And, um, you know, he told me kind of what to do on the tape. And I made up a tape, and I got a job in a small station. And I, I left home, left college. And um, thank God. And uh, here I am. All right, we'll find out about that first job when we return right here on Center State. Center stage and joined by New York Yankees announcer John Sterling. Uh, let's talk about that first job. Where was it? What was it? And how much did you get paid? Uh, it was in a town called Wellsville, New York. It was a tiny station. In Wellsville, my first job was $60 a week. And, you know, I had to learn how to run turntables and tape machines just before cartridges came in. And, um, but opening the mic and talking, I could do on my first day. And it was, uh, I loved it. Then you moved to Providence, Rhode Island. No, I, I had a few other small jobs. Okay. In uh, Watertown on radio and TV up there, and then in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and then Patchogue, Long Island. I didn't audition for the Yankee job, but to do a morning disc jockey show in Providence, <laughs> I must have auditioned five times. <laughs> They had a sister station in Hartford. I had to go there to audition. And I mean, tapes and meetings and auditions. And I got... And you love that stuff, knowing you. Yeah. You well, love meetings. <laughs> I don't like meetings. <laughs> I look, I'm good at live auditions because you have to do it. Right. You know, you can't screw around. Was this a rock and roll it. DJ? Yes. Did you like rock and roll music? I know you like Broadway. You know, I... <laughs> It was, it was my first market. So I did that for a couple of years. So then you go to Baltimore, and, and things are really starting to click. I mean, right. you're a big shot in Baltimore. General talk show, not yeah, just sports. Yeah, general talk show. Um, later on, the general manager, a guy named Don Kelly, I went down there and had a meeting. I couldn't audition. And um, you know, I sent him a news tape so they'd hear my voice. And um, later on, Don Kelly said, the reason I gave you the job was... You're the only one who told me you were going to be great. <laughs> so really? it was a wild, wild show. But I kept putting sports in it to get a sports rep. And then I got the TV equivalent. At, this was Metro Media. And the TV was Westinghouse. So I did, I swear, 9 to 12 midnight on radio and 9 to 10 in the morning on TV. Can you imagine? And then you, you ended up getting the Bullets play-by-play -play job in Morgan State University football. Right. So that, then you're getting a foothold in sports. Right. Uh, the next move then is you return to New York. And before there was FAN and ESPN radio, there was John Sterling yelling at people on Sports Talk. WMCA then was the most laissez-faire station. I said, you know, I'd like to get hockey on. There's a hockey team in town. And the program director said, well, go make a deal. New York Raiders. Yeah. Right. So I went there and I made a deal. We split uh, costs and uh, whatever that was sold. And I, I had a chance to do hockey. And then, then I got a call from the Knicks to do their radio network starting in January and February when Frank Messer, who was doing it, would go down to Florida. So all of a sudden, I'm so busy. I'm working all the time and loved it. And then it led to the Nets and Islanders and 
like that. Also, a side note that I always found amazing, you did the hockey, the Raiders games, and you did them with Fritz Peterson, the former pitcher for the Yankees. Right. How did that come about? He was a, um, a rink rat. You know, he, lived, he grew up outside of Chicago, so he played hockey, and um, I don't know if any of you remember, but Fritz Peterson and another Yankee pitcher, Mike Kekic, swapped wives and families, children, dogs, houses. <laughs> now, that would be outrageous on the Kardashians. So imagine what it was in the 70s. Right. So um, I'd be doing these, these hockey games, and I'd look at Fritz, and he was in another world. He had browned out, and I didn't know why. And then all of a sudden, I realized, I realized what he was thinking about. Oh, my goodness. You know, so. <laughs> You also get the New York Nets job, and then you get the New York Islanders job. One of your first signature calls that, you know, that is identified as Islander goal, right. where, where did that come from? It just comes just out excitement. of me, you know? Yeah. Every, every hockey announcer says he shoots, he scores. Like, that's religion. Right. So I didn't. I, I try to be ahead of the play. So when the shot would go in, I'd yell, goal, Islander goal, Islander goal. So like that, and it caught on. Now, the Nets, you actually did their... ABA championships, right. two of them, right? That must right. have been a, a blast. That was a great team. That was Dr. J. Fabulous, yeah. But of course, they didn't, they didn't know they were fabulous. They didn't know the ABA was fabulous. It turned out to be. Mm -hmm. They all went on to become all-stars right. they, when, they, when they joined the NBA. And um, I can recall one game, Sunday afternoon, Nassau Coliseum, there's no one there. And Dr. J made three or four phenomenal plays back to back to back to back. You know, he'd block a shot, drive down court, feed someone, get a rebound, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, Kevin Lockery actually called timeout just so he could get a, um, a cheer. Right. You know, so now, it was Lockery different. Now, was the coach there, and right. he's become a lifelong friend of yours. Did you know him before that? Yeah, we became buddies in Baltimore. Okay. He was playing for the Bullets, and we became good friends then, and we got lucky. We, we got to New York together, and then we got to Atlanta together. There's a lot more of the trip to take. Believe me, there is. So stick around. More on Center Stage. <laughs> this is Center Stage. We're joined by the one and only John Sterling. John, what we're going to do now is something that we call uh, Did You Ever? Okay, here we go. Did you ever steal anything? No. Did you ever eat an entire pizza by yourself? I can't remember. I'm sure I have. <laughs> Did you ever talk your way out of a traffic ticket? You know, somebody wrecking Oh, you? yes. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Did you ever walk out of a Broadway show? I wanted to walk out a few of them, but... But you didn't. Yeah. Did you ever host a kitten bowl? <laughs> I have. Did you ever call a game while suffering from food poisoning? I sure did. How'd you do that? I ran to the bathroom every half inning. Yeah. And uh, this is the second game of a doubleheader in Boston at Fenway Park. The first game took almost four hours. And then I had nothing to do between games. It obviously two admission. And I ate, and I ate the wrong thing. Boy, did I get sick. And uh, the second game, talk about timing. The second game was the longest nine-inning game in the history of baseball. It went four hours and 45 minutes. And I kept running to the other room every half inning. That was a terrible night. Now, I know this to be a fact because Joe Torrey told me this, so I'll ask you. Did you ever toss your car keys to a complete stranger at an airport and say, take care of it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was in Atlanta. I was, yeah, I was late for a change. <laughs> and I ran in. But now, they all knew me at this, at this desk, either Eastern or Delta, I forget which. And um, so I knew the person. And I, I had a big caddy, and I tossed the keys, and, and I said, my car is you know, right outside. Put it somewhere. I have to, I have to make the plane. <laughs> and they did. All right, in the early 1980s, you take the play-by-play -play job with Ted Turner's fledgling uh, cable empire. You call the Braves and the Hawks. Did you know this was going to be a huge hit? Did you know that it was going to change the world, really? No, he just started CNN, too, that right. year. And then it, then CNN headlines. And it's so different nowadays to today 
that I could walk in to Ted Turner's office and talk to him. And you can't imagine doing that now. And uh, it was... It was a very different time where um, they didn't have a lot of security. Mm -hmm. Of course, 9-11 changed all that. But What was Ted Turner like? Uh, he, was, he was very nice to me. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't think that he could be that brilliant. I mean, he was really, I mean, really brilliant. And also, he didn't care about money. He was willing to, you know, walk a tightrope to start these these emperors. I, I did not know it would get that to be that big is really. All right, many baseball uh, announcers have signature calls. Your home run call is, it is high, it is far, it is gone. Where did it come from? I was doing a Braves game and I was doing TV. Just another game, Mets playing the Braves. And Doc Gooden threw a breaking ball and it hung. And so as I'm doing the play by, Dale Murphy was the hitter. And so uh, I said, breaking ball, because you could see it hang. Mm -hmm. And then Murphy hit it. And in Atlanta, it was a circular stadium. So it, it framed home runs. No matter where you hit it, they were two decks and a framed home run. So I knew the ball was out. And so something happened inside of me. And I said, it is high, it is far. And it is gone. So that was the first time. And then you used it a lot after that? Or yeah. Just, you know, all the yeah. time? Yeah. Well, mostly when I got the Yankee job. Right. All right, we'll get to that point when we return right here on Center Stage. There it goes. Deep left field. It is high. It is far. It is gone. Aaron Judge hits one from here to there. All rise. Here comes the judge. Center stage. We're talking with the Emmy Award winning John Sterling. Now, it, it's become, you're not on Twitter, luckily, um, <laughs> but whenever there's a new Yankee player, it, it, everybody starts to say on Twitter, well, what's John's home run call going to be? How long in advance do you try to come up with a home run call? I don't think it's ad libbed at that point because some of them are pretty intricate. So, how, what's the process? Well, most of them have come at the moment. Um, but then when it became kind of a, a cottage industry, right. which was not the idea, uh, now I'm supposed to do one for every player. Well, writers give me some, fans give me some, some I think about. Uh, the, some of the best ones happened because it happened. Um, A-bomb from A-Rod. It's an A-bomb from A-Rod. Um, Robbie Cano, don't you know? Robbie Cano, not don't you know? Todd Frazier has been listening to us since he was a little boy, and he loves the Todd father. Todd Frazier homers in the left field seats. He is the Todd father. But some, you know, you, you have to work out a little bit. Clint Frazier, which I think is one of the best ones you've ever done, right. Downtown Goes Frazier. Right. Now, he's just a kid. Does he even know who Howard Cosell is? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. When Joe Frazier got knocked down uh, uh, many years ago, Howard Cosell said, down goes Frazier. Well, when Clint Frazier had a home run, I said, downtown goes Frazier. It is gone. Downtown goes Frazier. He thought that was great. He heard the Cosell in it, that's why. And then let, let's say that, that my life took a different turn, that I actually had athletic ability. <laughs> And I ended, up, I ended up making the Yankees. It's the seventh game of the World Series, and I've never hit a home run, but I hit one out. <laughs> what would your call be? Michael is okay. <laughs> Brilliant, right? Brilliant. <laughs> now, in 89, you make the move to the Yankee booth. Do you think this is the pinnacle? Do you have other plans? Or you say, listen, if it all ends here, I'm happy. I, I took the Yankee job because uh, I didn't want to become an old man and say, I should have done the Yankees. <laughs> so um, I took, you know, I rolled the dice. I'm leaving Atlanta, which I loved and had a great life. And um, I come to the Yankees and they, they were in a process, before Michael and I, they were in a process 
of getting rid of announcers every two years. And um, so I rolled the dice, and it's worked. And I, I sometimes can't believe that it's worked the way it has. I can't believe it. So now, Your first two years on the radio, John, you worked with Jay Johnstone, a right. former player. Then you work with Joe Angel for one. Right. The next move then, you end up getting me, a guy who was a newspaper writer, never had done this except in college. Was there trepidation on your part? What was your feelings about it? I'm sure you had some say. Look at, it. Look at us when we were young, John. Oh, my God. Nice haircut I have. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't forget, Michael and I were friendly from the get-go. We'd talk all the time. He'd be in the press box. I'd be in a broadcast booth. And so I felt that I knew what he could offer. And um, so I recommended Michael after all the auditions. And look how it worked out. Isn't that amazing? Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. I think so. Now, um, you throw the word Homer around, and I think it's ridiculous. And I'll just very quickly tell you listen to a tape of Game 7, the ninth inning of the 2001. World Series when the Diamondbacks beat the Yankees and tell me if the man's a homer because he called that as if he was right down the middle. I'll always remember that. I always tell people that. But John wants the Yankees to win. And I once said to John, why do you care so much? They don't care if we have good broadcast. <laughs> he said, Michael, I care because when you bring people good news and if they win championships, it's good for everybody. We had a nice 10 years. Go oh boy. Four World Series championships, five World Series appearances. During that whole time, was there one player that stood out to you that you just said, wow, I can't believe I'm watching this? Uh, I don't think so. I think I became more friendly with David Cohn than anyone else. Uh, off the field. because Off the field. Right. And Deion James before that, because we had been in, in Atlanta together. You know, Michael, I grew up watching all these great teams, so it wasn't like I... I had never seen great players before. You know, everyone would think I would say Derek Jeter, but, you know, the Yanks had a lot of terrific players and, um, and terrific teams. And, you know, I got lucky. I got you as a, a broadcast partner. And then we, we got to be friendly with Buck Showalter, who was managing the Yankees, and we're still just as friendly today. And then Joe Torre, who I became friends with in Atlanta, got the Yankee job. So I, I was very fortunate and I was surrounded. Yeah, unbelievable run. But the run continues and we continue on center stage when we return right here on Yes. Well, the Yanks have a 7-5 lead, so of course, as the case for the last 20 years, you gotta go to Mo. Welcome back to Center Stage. We're joined by John Sterling. Uh, so you have been working with Susan Waldman now a long time. When did you know that that would work? Well, we had been friends, as you know. Um, I was in Atlanta, and I helped get the general manager of WFAN, their first general manager, the job. I, mean, I, I gave him a, a great recommendation. And he asked me, they had a, a, a talk show host who had had a heart attack, and he was out for several months. And he said, well, I'd like you to come up and do the afternoon show uh, during uh, the All-Star break. So I came up, and the sports update person was Susan. So we got to be friends then. So I never doubted it would work. You know, and Susan has this tremendous passion. She wants to be great at every day and every game, and she really works at it. And we, uh, you know, obviously we get along great. Now, you get to call... Another World Series with her in 2009. And for the Yankees, it was a little bit of a drought since 2000. Uh, was that one different than the other four for you? New stadium, long drought? I think it was very exciting to be back. And, um, you know, it had one other thing. The other team was in Philadelphia, so it was very easy travel. Yep. You know, one of my favorite players is Hideki Matsui. Uh, I, I said a thousand times, it's too bad he's not from the United States because he's the all-American boy. <laughs> and uh, it pleased me exceedingly that he had that phenomenal uh, game, uh, homers and doubles and six RBIs in the clinching game. Now, I'm not asking you to pick your favorite trip. Of the five championships, what was your favorite one? 96. Because it was the first. Oh, sure. 
the fans obviously love you, but sometimes you get criticized by critics. Just sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Does that bother you? Well, I think you'd like everyone to love you, but it's not possible. You can't please everyone. And when I go on the air, I do what I do on the air. And um, if I, 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 in other words, I'm not trying to please the critics. Right. You want the fans. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> also, one more thing. They knock us for their own aggrandizement. I mean, they're, they're writing a column. They have nothing to write, and they want big names. So that's that. Um, if they really didn't like it, you know, they would <laughs> turn it off. So. Anything about your style that if you could change something, it, you would change this? Yeah, I'd like to. I always try to be ahead of the play. And in basketball, I sometimes would call shots good before they were good. You know, I thought they were good. Right. So I don't like being wrong, obviously. So if I could, I would, I would take it back a notch and try not to be ahead of the play. Called over 4,500 games in baseball and probably seen everything in a baseball game. But one of your favorite phrases, well, you can't predict baseball, Susan. Oh, boy. So is there anything that even stands out to you that you go, wow, I can't believe that happened? Well, I, I, absolutely. You stuck me on that one. Right. Something happened in a game that I say... I don't know. I mean, you always say you can't predict baseball, Susan. Now everybody says it. I say it on the TV side. <laughs> <laughs> and I call uh, Alan Paul Susan. Well, let me tell you this. <laughs> let me tell you this. The, the game we just saw, we just did... When Seattle made five errors in the first inning, I'd right. never seen that before. Right. You do, yeah. If you do baseball enough, you're going to see something almost right. every day that you've Absolutely. never seen. Absolutely. You can't predict baseball, Susan, but we can predict hit and run. That happens when we return right here on center stage. Now Rivera is set. And here's the payoff. Swung on and grounded to second. Cano fields, throws to first, in time. Ball game over. World Series over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. This is Seven Stage having a good time with John Sterling. And um, John, now it gets difficult. Hit and run. I'm going to say something the first thing that comes to your mind. You ready? Okay. You're not good with tests. I know this. <laughs> All right. What's a better experience for you, working on radio or TV? Radio. How come? Well, it's your medium. They, you do what you want, and you have to paint the picture, which I love doing, and it's just um, it's easier. You know, television, you have to follow the pictures. Favorite meal? Probably one of the many great steakhouses in the country and have, uh, you know, martinis and salad and steak and like that. Favorite restaurants around the country? Well, there's one in Baltimore that I adore, Prime Rib, and another one in Seattle called Metropolitan Grill. Those are two of them. Best venue for a sporting event? Whoa, wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Um, and it's so easy to say Pittsburgh or Cleveland or Baltimore, so I, I, I don't know. I guess Yankee Stadium. Okay. Yeah. You know, Yankee Stadium is so majestic they did everything right there are five tiers but the ball flies out which is a big thing with me i like offense and they did everything right and the ball flies out in yankee stadium the weirdest thing that ever happened to you while you were on the air my first year with the yankees you know there i am hunched over a microphone broadcasting true story and i see a body <laughs> go straight down <laughs> And uh, I said, Jesus. <laughs> and uh, some idiot had jumped out of the third deck onto the screen. I think he was high and far and gone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the announcer you love listening to? Uh, Vin, among others, Vin Scully. Favorite entertainer? Sinatra. Favorite Broadway musical? South Pacific. I impossible to answer. Favorite Yankee to travel with? <laughs> Joe Torrey, right? Okay, Joe Torrey. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Torrey, because he took me to dinner every night on the road for 12 years. It was great. <laughs> if you could have any three dinner guests in all time, who would they be? Uh, Frank Sinatra, 
uh, Cole Porter, and Noel Coward. What advice would an older, now mature John Sterling, <laughs> give to the young up-and-coming John Sterling? Uh, I don't know what I would tell him. I guess I'd tell him, you know, relax. <laughs> It'll work out. <laughs> yeah, but you don't know that at the time. Right, you but know. you know it now. Yeah. All right, now when John Sterling's, you know, you, you don't sleep that early. You, you stay up late. Favorite late night snack? You're in your sweatpants watching a movie. What are you eating? Tonight after the game when I go home, you know, I'll have a salad and a sandwich, something like that. But you're not a popcorn chip guy? No, no. Just a meal. Okay. Finally, if you were trapped in a foxhole, <laughs> what person would you most like to have in there with you to help you get out? <laughs> I piqued his interest. A Superman, I guess. <laughs> We're going to wrap things up with John when we return. <laughs>Welcome back to Center Stage. We've had a great time. The last hour with John Sterling. John, uh, serious stuff. In January of 2015, a huge fire in the New Jersey Avalon at Edgewater Complex building. That's where you lived. Everything that you owned went up in flames. What was that experience like? Well, I think uh, when any, anything like that happens, you know, you, you have to think about survival. And... Um, I was very lucky. First of all, in this terrible uh, fire, not one person was injured, no firefighter and no tenant, because it happened in the afternoon. And let's face it, if it happened at 2 in the morning, I wouldn't be here. You know, I could take care of myself. So I went to a hotel, and I shopped. I had to buy everything, everything. Mm -hmm. Every person that I knew Everyone in the business, broadcasters from all over the country, old girlfriends, everyone <laughs> called my phone or texted me to find out how I was, to tell me I could live with them. Um, the first text I got was from our buddy Mike Breen. All right. And Breen's text was, is there anything, anything I could do for you? you know, so it was, it was, uh, it, it made me feel wonderful. And then the Yankees stepped up, didn't Hal Steinbrenner make oh, up all the rings that were? Yes, and uh, the Emmy people gave me back all the Emmys for, um, uh, for Yankeeography and, um. Fans stepped up? Yeah, uh, it, it, just amazing. Uh, people offered me their, their places. Uh, hey, well, I did. Hmm? A Rod. A Rod did. You Buck should have Show done Walter that. That would have been fun. You and A Rod. <laughs> I had things to do in Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> now you've given your time to a lot of uh, charitable causes. I know that one of them is the Leukemia so Society of America. Why is that so close to you? Uh, my uh, best buddy, Mike Faraday, uh, died of leukemia, so I decided to work for him. <laughs> now a lot of young men and women, some of them sitting in this audience right now want to get into the business, sports broadcasting, is more than ever before. What advice would you give them? Boy, never listen to no. <laughs> you know, I think you have to work at it um, in some way. Um, you know, Sal Marciano once said that uh, the only <laughs> job that you don't need experience is broadcasting and prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, if you want to go, well, Michael can tell you this. If you want to, if you want to go in the business, boy, get a hard shell and never listen to no. 29 years now. You're in your 29th year as the voice of the Yankees mm -hmm. on the radio. Uh, you show up every day with unbelievable energy. You love doing it. How long do you want to do it? Well, first thing I have to do is I have to get four kids through college. So, <laughs> so that will be it. I, I will see. You know, after that, after they're all through, you know, we'll see. I can't imagine retiring. Mm -hmm. I just read an article about um, Carl Reiner. And I wish I could think of the others. Mel Brooks? Mel Brooks, yes. They're never going to retire. Tony Bennett, they're never going to retire. So I, I, at this point, I feel this way. I figure I'll collapse in the booth one day. <laughs> Well, we hope that's way, way down the line. <laughs> Me too. The 10 years I had with you were a blast, and this hour has been a blast. Thank you, Thank John. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. That's John Sterling. I'm Michael Kay, and this is Center Stage. So long, everybody.
you listen to John, you're visualizing the game as he's speaking. You could see Derek Jeter make that jump throw. And the way he calls his home runs, it's just awesome. He brings a passion to the game. Uh, something, and, he, and he's the kind of person that makes you feel like you want to be his friend. You got the impression he always loved what he was doing, and he kind of drew you into his, his ideas and his thoughts about what was happening.